test, test, test. Hallo zur Radical Deconstruction am Tag 2 der Konferenz. In Kürze wird es losgehen. Äh, wir haben noch ein paar technische Sachen zu klären und dann begrüßen wir euch zu spannenden Dialogen. Test, test, test. Ist es, ist es besser? Hallo, 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 hallo. Eins, eins. Guten Tag, guten Tag, guten Tag, guten Tag, guten Tag, guten Tag. Hallo, 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 hallo. Ja, Test, Test, 1, 1, wir sind wieder hier live. Im Test der Technik und schauen, ob wir das hinbekommen. An einem wunderschönen Samstag, Nachmittag, Vormittag, Morgen treffen wir uns und wir bringen Zeit miteinander, diskutieren, äh, kommen ins Gespräch, tauschen uns aus, verletzen uns. Und ähm, heute begrüßen wir zum einen Radio Vita, Radio Aktivität. Ähm, wir haben das Kulturhausbruch für die Theater. Im zweiten Slot begrüßen wir Tunika Hunters, Miranda Krings. Wir haben Asma Ayat und äh, Tessa Hartig.
third languages in a day. And when we started to join Radio Vita, we wanted to talk uh, with several people to give them a free space that they are more heard. And but we decided at the beginning, it changed a lot, but I start from the beginning, we wanted to cooperate with an organization which is called Falzenrock FM. They are making radio broadcasts with people, elderly people, which are living in nursing homes. They are making great podcasts and broadcasts with them, and we cooperated with them. And then a second organization, uh, we wanted to also uh, invite another organization which is called Interface. Uh, this is an organization also working in Vienna. They work with the young people who are completely new in Vienna and they are making edu educational activities with them. We cooperated with them, we had several meetings, everything was ready and suddenly COVID-19 occurred. We had to cancel everything and we were thinking, oh God, everyone is at home, we cannot reach people, how we will make our workshops. But just after this, uh, in the summer of 2020, like mostly of the all around the world, Black Lives Matter protest took place in Vienna. And during this protest, there were much more new voices, groups, discussion groups, associations, initiatives came up. And we realized that these groups need more place to be heard, to be visible, to be seen. And then we cooperate with them. And we realized our workshops meet with a group of 12, 13 uh, young black people who are living in Austria, in Vienna. Shortly, I can say. All right. Thank you, Oscar. Well, actually, COVID and the pandemic changed all of our lives. So I think this is needless to, to say. And it had uh, effects also on how we carried out our projects. Uh, for some organization a little bit more, for some organization a little bit less, depending on what was the format that we had already decided. But uh, thank you also for sharing the pre and the post part to, to see that also through the pandemic things were done in a different way. Mm -hmm but they could still be done. Mm -hmm. So I think this, uh, this, is, this is a great learning also, like a little bit to adapt to the situation. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if you wanted now to show, uh, to hear also to the... Um, Should I talk about more about the workshops or what we did or...? Uh, maybe we will go on, on. On, the, okay. on the questions. Those are questions that I'm asking uh, you directly, but mm -hmm. we invite, like, I invite you all to add stuff if you feel like it. And mm -hmm. also, as I said before, to the audience, if you want to ask questions about what we're talking about. Um, so let's go to the, the second part. Radioactivité. Radioactivité brought the expertise of working with radio workshops uh, within the Radio Vita group. Um, because we are different organizations working with community and communities um, and different methodologies. But for example, La Chicha or Elan, or, but also Stand, uh, had never really dipped into radio workshops. That's what Radioactivité also shared and taught us a little bit. Um, so I would ask you, Silvia, how did you prepare uh, the workshops and what are the main activities that you did like in the framework of the radio workshops so we can understand a little bit more. Okay. I go to speak uh, French and Tony translate for me. Du okay. coup, nous avons fait cette série d'ateliers, c'était trois ateliers à Marseille, en collaboration avec une association qui s'appelle Secours Catholique, qui est une association de Caritas en France. So they did three workshops in Paris with the association called Secours Catholique. Secours Catholique. Uh, it's um, for, what's about Secours Catholique? Uh, C'est une association qui, qui travaille avec uh, différents profils des gens. Uh, they help different kind of people in, daily, in a daily basis. Et pour ces, cette série d'ateliers, uh, ils ont recruté uh, six femmes, uh, six mamans, qui ne travaillent pas pendant la journée et qui se sent isolés de la société. Okay, so, Secours Catholique recruited six uh, women, they were mothers, who um, don't work, um, and so they had free time to yeah, participate. Uh, 
Du coup, on s'est retrouvé trois fois le matin pour deux heures et demie euh, pour faire du coup cette série d'ateliers. Et well, um, they they met three times uh, for uh, two hours and a half workshops. Et pour préparer les ateliers euh, avec deux autres bénévoles de l'association, euh, nous avons adapté vraiment le, les activités au profil de, de ces femmes. Uh, Radioactivité, avec l'aide de deux volontaires, a uh, adapté les workshops pour ce profil de uh, mothers. Parce que c'est des, des femmes, il y avait une femme française et, et les autres étaient étrangères, du coup il y avait une albanaise. Une marocaine, une tunisienne, une algérienne. Okay, there were, um, <laughs> among the women, there were one French woman, um, an Tun Albanian one, Tunisian, a Tunisian one, uh, Algerian. Algerian. Yeah. Um, and they were not integrated in the society. Et du coup, pour elle, c'était vraiment une occasion, une opportunité pour euh, s'exprimer, pour, euh, pour parler de sujets dont normalement elles n'ont pas l'occasion de parler. As they are not integrated in the society, uh, it was for them the occasion to to speak, to express what they felt. Et pour faire ça, on a fait un premier atelier euh, parce qu'en fait, l'idée c'était de faire une émission radio à la fin des, des trois ateliers. Because the, the idea was to to do um, a podcast, a podcast mm -hmm. yeah, at the end of the workshop. Et du coup, au début, nous avons fait un atelier pour expliquer euh, le matériel radio et pour commencer à faire des interviews croisées entre elles sur différentes thématiques. The first uh, workshop was about uh, introducing radio material and uh, peer interviews. Le deuxième atelier, c'était euh, sur le rôle du journaliste. The second one was about the Journalist role. Et euh, sur comment répondre à des questions, comment poser des questions. Et nous avons écouté euh, trois podcasts. Du coup, on a fait une sorte de séance d'écoute euh, où elles, elles avaient l'opportunité de réagir sur ces, ces podcasts qu'on a écoutés. Et les thématiques, c'était la maternité, <rire> euh, le voyage et euh, ah, le premier amour. Et so, um, <laughs> For the journalist, it was the role of journalist. It was about uh, how to ask questions and answer questions. And um, what else? Um, uh, there Nous were, avons fait des écoutes. Yeah, des uh, okay, yeah. Th um, they listened to three podcasts and they reacted on it. And uh, finally, there were three uh, main themes that were uh, maternity, travel, first and first love. Okay. Euh, et le troisième atelier, donc, c'était l'émission radio euh, que nous avons enregistrée et dont nous avons créé un podcast. Euh, and the last and third um, workshop was about the creation of the podcast. Mm. Yeah. Voilà. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah. Thank you, Sylvia, and thank you, Tony, for the translation. Uh, so, as we heard. Uh, The workshop weren't just about creating the podcast, creating the product. It was um, it was an occasion to meet, to work about topics that uh, our participants were concerned about and things that they really wanted to to be represented. It was a constructive uh, workshop, and it also worked on um, social skills, individual skills, communication skills. Uh, so my question for Eloise will be about uh, the feedback, the evaluation from the from the participants. What did what at the end of the workshop they felt that it changed? What they felt it improved? How was their experience within the workshop? Thanks. Um, just to give you a little um, background of the workshops that we did, it was during the last summer just after the big uh, confinement, lockdown, lockdown <laughs> sorry. And uh, we run this workshop in La Californie. It's a place in the countryside of France um, with 11 uh, young people. And uh, there, the young people were from uh, an organization called L'Ecole de la Deuxième Chance. It's for people um, who have uh, like um, 
difficulty in school and uh, the organization help these young people to construct a professional project. So we proposed three days of workshop with them and um, it was really nice because at the beginning they were like, oh, you're a teacher and they are like in, I don't know how to say, but defensive uh, uh, approach. And um, step by step, we saw them open. And uh, at the beginning, also, they were very stressful with the microphone, maybe like me, <laughs> like, uh, like the heart beating and uh, and the, the and uh, the voice, uh, la voix tremblée, shaking voice, shaking yeah. voice. And um, step by step, they were more spontaneous with the microphone. They were laughing and. Uh, they um, also at the beginning they were like uh, they don't have they were not used to talk about themselves and uh, about their f own feelings and all this stuff and um, step by step they start to talk about their own stories and uh, about uh, the um, the link with school so it was really interesting to see all this progress and um, the how do you say directrice? The headmaster. The headmaster of the school told us that they, she was very impressed to see that they talk a lot and uh, normally they come just one day to the workshop and they not come again and they did all the workshops. So I think radio um, had them a lot to, to talk. And was there anything like in specifically that they felt they they learned? In fact, <laughs> they were very interested by the materials of radio and about the uh, digital competencies. And um, but the evaluation was a little odd for them because they were not used to to write. So um, I. I um, I, I, oh. <laughs> sorry. Uh, J'ai um, remarqué plus dans l'observation que par l'évaluation. Well, more about observation than uh, writing evaluation, basically. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Louise. Uh, it is in fact like that because when we when we build our workshop, no, we have the different phases. We are like the warm up, and then we talk like about the methodologies, and we, then we go deeper into the contents. And then we have always this part about the evaluation that, especially in European projects, is a very important part. Is what organizations also like need to show how the project was innovative of what were the needs that were fulfilled. But all of this is about adaptation. So the recruitment was adapted, then the, the workshop uh, methodologies were adapted to the groups that we were working with because it was a co-constructive workshop. And then the evaluation as well. Because of course, um, depending on the groups that we work with, then we can have like the more formal evaluation, but most of the time we have to adapt and do like no formal evaluations, oral evaluations, um, observe how people are reacting and what is their change of attitude. So I think that also from the organizational part, this is the learning that we carry with ourselves when we end these workshops, which is always like learning from, from the participants, learning from the audience, learning how to adapt to and how to get closer to people to actually give them the, the opportunity f for active participation. So this is actually a really, like, it's really good that you say, you know, it's about observation because they weren't used to it and, mm -hmm. and that's fine, it works as well. I don't know if uh, up to this point is there any question in the audience or in the streaming maybe? Yes, Ariana. Um, I'm sorry, the name of the radio is Stan, is that the name? Özge. Özge, the name is Stan 129. We have a podcast, yeah, we released now two different, we had at the end of the workshops two different podcasts, each are t uh, 35 minutes, they are now on Spotify to hear, and they will be also soon at the homepage of Radio Vita. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, actually, all of our organization uh, produced some workshops. So we have, uh, like, in the podcasts are obviously in on in our languages. So for La Chicha, they are in Spanish and in Catalan, a little bit of a mix. But we have it in German and in French as well. Uh, we have a website, the the project website, where also like the material is being uploaded together, also with the with the written materials that we developed. Um, which, for example, the, what we're talking about today, it will be on the second document that we produced, which is Making Voices Be Heard, which is a collection of case studies where we uh, talk about our organization. It's a little bit what we are uh, sharing here today. Uh, and it's meant to be like inspiration maybe for, uh, for other professionals or uh, community leaders or uh, people that want to reproduce uh, the same kind of workshops or, uh, or projects. So definitely all of these is available online on Spotify and on the website. Yes. Um, what kind of uh, workshop did you do in, in, in Barcelona? <laughs> okay. In, uh, in Barcelona, we carried out two different workshops. The first one was uh, in collaboration with a foundation that is called ECOM who is working with women uh, with uh, physical disabilities. And they felt like they were being discriminated f in two ways, intersectional uh, among them, for being women and for having like this difference, what the, what the, the society sees as a disability and it's just a, a, a diverse uh, way of uh, moving and living life. So they worked, um, they also worked on, uh, like we did the first series of workshop with them. It was on Zoom. This is one of the adaptation that we did uh, due to COVID because it was done in uh, between April and May of last year uh, in four sessions. And they uh, worked on narratives. Um, they read and listened to a lot of material talking about women and talking about people with disabilities. Um, they, um, they went deeper into the emotions that they felt. There was also like something very interesting to me that they worked on, which is how does society teaches us to be women, uh, to be girls since we are very young. Uh, the second series of workshop that we did, it's called The Sex of Angels. And since it was also uh, taking place during COVID, it was basically about exploring uh, presentiality and virtuality when we talk about love, when we talk about sex. Uh, how do we feel, like what taboos do we have in society? What limitations do we feel when we uh, express on a more e emotional way? Um, so yeah, those are the, the ones we, we carried out. It is for me. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you you were asking about the terminology, you know, that we are talking that they, they like we're talking about people that feel isolated, feel discriminated, and you're saying uh, it's actually like most of the time is a fact. Um, my answer to that is that it is a fact, uh, indeed. Uh, but w what we wanted to work on is that since w we plant little seeds, so we cannot uh, suddenly and through a workshop change society or how everybody else uh, besides the group sees the group. What we can start working on is the empowerment, is the self-consciousness of what we are, of how we like to be uh, represented, of uh, what, is, wh what and where is our identity. And through this empowerment, then go to the world and say, hey, I'm here. 
I'm this way, this is my identity, and the way you're representing me, it doesn't coincide with what I feel I am. I don't know if that answers the questions, but it's kind of like it, it's, it's a, an approach from the inside, let's say. Um, I was interested in what you were saying about um, evaluation, and I was wondering how your funders maybe react um, to allowing your participants to be flexible with how you evaluate. Are they very strict with evaluations and, and very rigid and maybe not very open-minded when it comes to honouring or facilitating your participants? How does that work? I don't know if, do you want to end? I will answer that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so for sure, in the framework of the European projects, um, we are required to present a series of documentation about the evaluation as well, because you have to show like that the work that you're doing is actually meaningful and that you are bringing the changes or the improvements that you want to, that you were promoting. Um, so it is strict, but it's also flexible on the other side be because we can also count on our own observation and evaluation. So for example, if you read the, the document, making our voices heard, uh, the evaluations, uh, there is part of the evaluations which is uh, from the participants, so there are like literally numbers from one to five where one is the last, the least, sorry, and five is the best, like the 35% 35, 35 of participants voted like that or that. But then there is also an important part about um, no formal evaluation and about observation from the organizations. So um, it is strict when it comes to the documentation that you have to submit, uh, but definitely uh, you can also explain in the narratives and the reports uh, what you as an organization are seeing uh, in the, as a result of the workshop. Uh, I'm also, I was also part of the workshops um, here, the radio workshops, and um, also part of the evaluation and part of assessing the impact of these workshops, of course, are the actual shows that are being produced because they were like structured in a way that um, participants should like set their, the topics that they want to um, talk about. And um, I think like, of course you could analyze on a very social uh, sociologyist level um, some sort of um, development, um, like the de development of within the participants like self-expression skills, like um, being able to talk in front of an audience, being able to um, frame a topic from their um, perspective. But of course we don't have to do this. We don't have to somehow um, make a qualitative analysis of um, their shows. But I think this could be a very important uh, factor when assessing um, the success of a workshop is assessing the actual output that is being created which is the, sh the radio show. Thank you, Bachi. I would like to add something to Bachi also. Uh, now, after the workshops that we made in Vienna, they are officially over now, but the group is still together and they're producing new podcasts. They are working together now. This is also important for uh, informal evaluation. And that's a great impact, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So I have a question about the actual podcasts, um, because podcasts are, are an interesting thing at this point. I love podcasts. Um, it's one of my favorite things in the world. And at the same time, one could also say that we're oversaturated with podcasts at the moment. It's a lot, a lot of output. And, and the only negative side to that, I think, is how do you find these things? And my question is also if you've been working with, I don't know, media partners trying to bring, let's say, the marginalized topics into the mainstream, how can there get more visibility to these, these things you're creating? 
I can tell you about our experience in uh, in in Barcelona, well, in Catalonia, and we are uh, like through the development of the podcast, uh, we were also collaborating with the radio. It's a public radio from a, from a town that it's called Mataró. It's like 45 kilometers from Barcelona, maybe. Um, so they actually helped us also editing and producing the podcast, and uh, they were online. They are online. They were online on their web website. Uh, they broadcasted it in their programs, both in uh, television and in radio, uh, as a way to reach also the the general public to actually making these voices be heard. I don't know if somebody else wants to share what you did in your countries uh, to for dissemination of the podcast. Okay. Um. Friend. <rire> du coup, euh, nous on utilise beaucoup Facebook et les réseaux sociaux. We use Facebook and uh, me social media a lot. Parce qu'avec euh, avec notre association, on, on fait beaucoup d'ateliers dans des milieux um, comme des centres sociaux, des euh, des centres d'accueil, des camps de réfugiés. They um, usually do a lot of workshops with um, social centers. And, um, euh, centre d'accueil, centre yeah, et uh, uh, refugees camps. Refugees camps. Yeah. Et nous nous sommes rendus compte que c'est beaucoup plus simple de partager euh, du coup les missions euh, à travers les réseaux sociaux parce qu'on arrive à toucher des communautés différentes que nous on ne pourrait pas toucher. They find it way easier to share their um, podcast uh, through social medias and yeah, they succeed in uh, reaching General public. Et de, surtout des communautés qu'on ne peut pas... And communities toucher. they can reach. Yeah. Mais on a publié aussi des, des podcasts sur des médias français. Enfin, des, des médias, ouais. And they also published mm. uh, yeah, the podcast on... Um, des médias. On, on French <laughs> media, yeah. Just to add something, uh, also for us, the podcast is not the aim. The radio is like a pretext to, to talk to each other, to have a dialogue, but we are not focused on uh, what we can do to have a beautiful podcast, for example. And it's also the creation of the podcast is also for the participants in the first um, aim. Um, to because uh, I think it's important to add your voice and to add that you're able to to do uh, radio. So for my side, I <laughs> didn't focus a lot of how I will spread the the podcast, but I did dissemination, of course. <laughs> okay, I don't know if there are any other questions or questions coming from the streaming. Okay, so now I have a question for all of you, all of us. Um, if somebody, uh, organizations, groups, formal or informal groups, were interested in uh, making also a radio workshop, like inspired in Radio Vita, like maybe reading about what we did, they, they would like to reproduce it or modify it, but do something similar, what would you suggest? What are your tips? Yeah. Okay. I would say um, we were basically using theater and radio methodology together when we had workshops. And radio is a great uh, tool to make things really visible, more than TV or something different. Because when you hear something, you really concentrate yourself. You are there. You are just at the moment, and you realize it. You hear it, and it's taking so much space all around the room. It's everywhere when you hear a voice. So it's a great medium to make, uh, especially the issues that not have been talked so much in the main dominant discourse. Uh, don't be afraid of it. Start and. Uh, Just courage, I would say. Start a talk and you find your way with it. And you certainly, most of you also use theater methodology because to be at the moment, to use your voice, to use your body, such exercises were very helpful for our participants in Vienna that they were realizing 
what I do with my voice when I say this in this way, what happens by the audience when they hear me. And we were also recording all sessions that they can immediately hear after the workshop and realize what I did with my voice, with my words. I would say, don't be afraid, talk more, be louder, and use radio as a great medium for all discourse to be, all discussion points, all issues to be talked loudly now all around the world. Thank you. I think uh, you tackled actually a really, really important thing, which is uh, radio actually, it does have like the power oh, to, yeah. to make the, the voice be heard, not, but not just the voice, but what you are saying with your voice. Uh, it is also important uh, to, to underline that the methodologies that bring to the, to, brought us to the project are different. Um, now, like at La Chicha, we were using forum theater because it's what we specialize on uh, stand as well. Uh, maybe Silvia can tell us a little bit more about the methodology that you use for the radio workshop. But um, for the technical part, for example, I mean, we made also a kind of a, a radio workshop guide uh, for organizations and groups uh, who don't have the knowledge on how to uh, record, how to edit uh, a podcast. So um, maybe also that is important, that you don't have to be an expert. Of course, it's always uh, good to be, uh, to, to, to be able to count on experts in uh, radio workshops. But also what is important, and it's something that Eloise was pointing out also before, is the process. How do you get to have this product, the methodologies that you have? So I will say to organizations that are not working directly with, the, with radio, that it's a challenge for sure. But that also, like in order to, to, to get to the product, you can use different methodologies, the methodologies that you, that you own and that you are um, uh, confident with. Um. Uh, just a little information. Sylvia and me will run a workshop, a radio workshop this afternoon. So if you want to, to see the methodology and to try uh, radio, you, you're welcome. At 12 o'clock. Uh, maybe after yeah. because we are really yeah. late but uh. yes we have two radio workshops the first one will be facilitated oh. by uh, Silvia, Eloise and Emmanuel I guess um, and also we have another radio workshop in the afternoon at 2.30 that I will be facilitating with Clara and as we are not experts in radio, as I was saying before, we will be working more on the methodologies that brought, bring us to, to working with, uh, with, the, with the radio. I think that time is running by very fast. It's always like that when you're having fun, it's like, you poop, it flies. <laughs> uh, so I guess we should uh, go on to the second part of this presentation. Um, for my part, and I guess from all the group, thanks a lot for the participation until now. It's been great. Like, well, it was, it's always worrying when you have like a session called in dialogue, but you're supposed to make a presentation. It's like, it will, will it be a dialogue actually? So thanks a lot for helping us and for being here with your bodies and with your minds. I will pass on the mic. Uh, Emmanuel.
Okay. Ähm, hallo zusammen und äh, vielen Dank, dass Sie zu diesem Workshop äh, gekommen sind. Äh, die ähm, drei äh, Verbände werden sich verstellen und über ihr Projekt auf äh, Englisch sprechen. <lacht> äh, <lacht> das ist äh, Antoine äh, von äh, Radioaktivité, Eloise von äh, Elan, Daniela von Laticha und wir sind äh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel von Radioaktivité und äh, Tony von Elan. Um, do you want to ask the first okay. question? So we will start with questions and the first question is can you shortly <laughs> introduce your organization you are working in and maybe we can start with radioactivity Antoine. Okay so I am working with a radioactivity which is a French uh, association we are 10 facilitators you have already met uh, Sylvia who was just here before there is also Emmanuel and Juma. Uh, radioactivity, it's sort of itinerant radio uh, because we, we go to people which are uh, especially in some isolated places. So we go to refugee camps, to prison. We go also to very rural villages and uh, we train people to make their own radio broadcast. So we provide the equipment, of course, and uh, we train them to manage a radio show. And uh, we try to facili facilitate the debate in order uh, for the participants to, to talk about subjects they care about. So the goal of this association of radio activity is really to create a space for dialogue, uh, but also a space for empowerment because people are creating their own show. They are the journalists of their show. And uh, also in radio activity, we try to, yes, to, to spread all the, the show they, they are doing because then when they create their own pod podcast, it creates very rich sound material. And uh, I think we can, we can listen to something. Uh, I just want to to listen to uh, an extract. Uh, Juma, maybe you can put P1, please. We have a code together. For the foreigners, there is no opportunity for us to work as a refugee. We are ready to work. And anytime we go to search for a job, to go for an interview, they just said, where are you from? Oh, you are Nigerian. We cannot employ you. And when you go to CAF to ask for the support, the family assistance, and they tell you, oh, because you are from Nigeria, we are sorry, we cannot pay you. So I don't really understand that aspect of it. And majority of us, we have made a prostitution in France, and we have stopped it, and we are ready to stop it for good. But now, the French government, they are saying they want to stop the OFI for supporting us. But I think it's really not a good idea, because if you stop the money, if you stop paying us this little assistance you people are rendering us, I believe majority of us, we are ready to go back to, to make this prostitution because with this money, we buy food, we buy clothes, we take care of ourselves and we are happy. But now we are not working and there is no money, no assistance coming. Then I think it will be difficult for us to live here in France. I'm pleading with the French government to please continue paying us this allowance, this little allowance. It will make good things in our life. That's what I have to say right now. Thank you. I decided to show you, to, le to listen to you, <laughs> this extract, because sometimes when we, we arrive with uh, all the equipment and we, we, we train people to make their own broadcast, their own show, they use it to, because they are facing very strong situations. And so they use it to spread and to talk about what they, what they live, because for them it's a way to express themselves, because uh, there is always someone talking f for them and they can't talk by themselves. So with radioactivity, we try to, to help people to be actors of their own speech and to spread what, uh, what they are living. And uh, sometimes there is some workshop, people, they just arrive and they say, we have to say something. And we try to facilitate some activities, but they are very strong and they know what they want to say. And sometimes they just do a radio show where they have fun, where they talk about multiple, 
various th thematic, for example, football, music, and so on. So really, that's what it is, radioactivity. <laughs> yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Maybe we can hear Eloise from Eloa, Elan. <laughs> Sorry, Eloise, Elan. <laughs> Hello, um, so I will repeat myself, sorry. Um, so I am from Elan Interculturel, it's a French organization based in Paris, dedicated uh, to the creation of tools in the field of interculturality. So um, Elan Interculturel encourages dialogue between cultures and a better understanding of each other. So we try to um, encourage a sense of inclusiveness, welcoming, listening to the other, at the same time as a better understanding of our own identity. And Elan, for over 10 years, I think, 15 years maybe, Elan Interculturel has been developing projects uh, inspired by theater, dance, uh, movement, music, and more. Suspense. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Maybe, Daniela, you can explain yourself about La Chicha. Yeah, um, I'll try to be quick. Uh, La Chicha Teatra is uh, an organization that was founded in 2010 and is based in Barcelona, but we don't only work in Barcelona, we work in Catalonia, we work in Spain, but we also have projects uh, in South America and in Africa. Um, what do we do? The main methodologies that we use are the theater of the oppressed and process work. We especially uh, give uh, workshops um, to, and create performances about uh, forum theater um, because uh, we consider it as a very powerful tool um, for people to um, build their own stories. The w our workshops are about uh, people participating in them, sharing their stories, sharing the, the, the oppressions uh, that they are living uh, because of the way society is functioning, and con like in community in those groups, to creating a story, a story that is not just an individual story, but is, it passes from being individual to being collective. What happens when we perform it, when we present it to the public? What we want to do is to start from the scene that we present, uh, talking about this oppression, which has all, like, can be um, connected to uh, racism, to discrimination uh, based on origins, to gender, uh, and so on. And they're usually pretty short, so it's like, it's a, it's a way of putting really the focus on one problem or a, an intersection of problems that, that the group is facing and then opening the debate with the, with the community, with the audience. Uh, so what happens is that uh, you don't only present the oppression, but you're also looking for a communitarian way of resolving it of like finding strategies of what we can do in our daily life uh, when we see s things that are happening. How can we make the change? What is the society that we want to live in and how do we do it? Because it's easy to say, oh, no, it's not easy actually. But uh, it would be like the basis, uh, I'm, I'm oppressed, for this reason, and I have this difficulty. I'm facing this discrimination. But then the real challenge is to have a community that accompanies you to find strategies to come out of it, uh, to make uh, yourself being visible, and to have the support of people that are either are living the same situation or are at least acknowledging that that exists and that needs to be uh, faced that needs to be addressed. Okay, thank you. Um, what we also wanted to know was um, why are you part of your organization? What motivates you? Um, yeah. uh, Daniela, do you want to keep going on? <laughs> 
Well, I think I said, uh, I said a lot. Uh, actually, I promised to be short and I wasn't. Uh, but that's also my motivation there. That's what I believe in. That's why I'm part of La Chicha, because I see the power that it has. Uh, I, when, I, when I arrived to Barcelona, La Chicha Teatro was one of the first organizations that I met uh, through uh, the Theater of the Oppressed. And I always like, looked at La Chicha like, you know, they're doing something that is meaningful. They're doing something that I, I see it as an impact. I, like when you get out of the room, when you get out of the performance, you keep thinking about it. You're like, you know, I'm part of this and I want to change this and how do I do it? And it's very inspiring. All the suggestions that come from the audience are very inspiring and actually like makes you, they make them want you keep working. Uh, that's my main motivation really. Like I see the power of um, the methodology and I really, I really believe in it. And at the moment, I couldn't do anything different, I feel. Great. Eloise, do you want to share with us? Yes, but it's difficult to have the same passionate speech. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I will try. <laughs> um, so I was a student in fine arts in France. And uh, I was really interested by uh, participatory art and how to create safe and horizontal space to um, have a, to engage people to a common creation. And uh, at the same time, I, I was really interested um, to the issues related to sexuality and intimacy uh, as a uh, as a young woman myself. So um, I, when I finished my studies, I decided to, to become a volunteer in Elan Interculturel because I would like also to have a more inclusive approach in my work. And I thought it will be for six months and now it will, uh, I am uh, in Elan since four or five years. <laughs> and um, I, I really like to call project and international and European project uh, related to sexuality and gender. And Antoine, yeah. um, I am a journalist and uh, when I have created Radioactivité five years ago, uh, I was a bit tired of uh, going to people and making interviews just one by one and uh, people were telling how difficult was the life. I was just listening and then broadcasted. And I felt that something was missing, actually. And so uh, with Radioactivité, I wanted to, uh, uh, to, to do things where people can be actors of their speech, as I said, but in group, let's say this way. And uh, this, as a journalist, it's not possible, or it's very rare. So I wanted to, in one way, to share what I know in radio. Uh, with people that I was interviewing, but also that they are create. I wanted them to create their own radio, because I think in group they can speak for themselves and they can find solution, and they can uh, explain what they live. They can talk about what they want, May way better that I can do as a journalist. I think. So yeah, I I wanted to use radio like uh, yes, like an excuse to create a group of people to talk together and have. A beautiful podcast at Good the end. Good excuse. Yep. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, can you share with us some projects that you are working on? Maybe we can start with you, Antoine, and Radioactivité. Sure. Uh, there is some picture, so Juma, you can put it. Uh, we have a, a project that... Uh, uh, here you have just some picture of, uh, of um, uh, workshops. There is some workshop, we just go once to some place and uh, in a few hours people create their own broadcast uh, just in a few hours. And it's very interesting because you go somewhere and people can do something uh, what they, which they care about just in one day, just like that. And, but sometimes it's a bit frustra frustrating. So that's why we have created uh, like a box, a radio box, uh, which is Autonomous Studio. And in some places, we just give this autonomous radio studio so people can 
uh, do their own radio show alone. Like we just give the equipment, we of course we we train them, and then we leave, and they have all the material to to run uh, uh, by themselves. And maybe Juma, you can put uh, the pictures of the of the radio box so people can see it. Uh, this um, so you see it's a very small box. Uh, so. Um, I wanted to, to talk with you with this project because we have done it in a, in a few places. We have done it in uh, Lebanon, for example, uh, at the border with the Syria, and uh, it was uh, some women, they got this, this box, and now they are running their own radio show talking about what is important for them. And we, also, we have also done it in uh, Calais, in north of France, uh, because there is lots of people who try to go to England and uh, their conditions are just awful in north of France because they are facing uh, a police which is very strong uh, and also they are facing French administration which is also horrible with them. So the conditions in Calais are very difficult and uh, uh, we, we went there and we talked a lot with people to see how a radio could help. And uh, uh, we had lots of discussion because actually we have our ID or a radio could help in Calais. But of course it was not a good idea. <laughs> so we discussed with people and finally we have done a radio which was working uh, through WhatsApp. And uh, most of, uh, of uh, what is doing this radio, they are giving uh, practical information for people in Calais uh, like very practical, uh, like uh, where to eat, where to have a shower, things like that, in five or four languages, depends on the time. And uh, all the podcasts are going through WhatsApp. And uh, also there is some normal, regular program where people speak about what they want, about music, about stuff. And also there is this program with all basic and very important information in such a place. So this was the project I wanted to talk about. And the radio, of course, is still going there because they have their own radio box, so they can manage on their own. Okay, thank you. And maybe, Danilia, can you talk uh, us about your projects in La Chicha? Yes, could we show the website, please? So La Chicha is working uh, right now on several European projects, but also local and uh, international. This is one of the projects that we uh, started in 2020. It's called Rebella. Uh, the full name is Religion, Beliefs, and Laicity in Cultural Heritage to Foster Social Inclusion in Adult Trainings. What does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> it means that um, we are very used to be very Eurocentric. Uh, we are very used to talk about Spanish culture, French culture, Hungarian culture, and we sometimes uh, forget that all those cultures are actually a big puzzle of many other things that come from our traditions, from our history, from influences that come from other parts of the world, but especially we're forgetting about the reality, which is that in Spain, not only Spanish people live, in France, not only French people live, and so on. So this project uh, aims to actually foster the presence of the different cultures that are uh, part of this puzzle, uh, promoting promoting them as a base for, for people to realize that there are other realities that they can come together. Um, and it's especially focused on religion and culture. Um, I will read a data that was actually the inspiration for the project in order like, to be a little bit precise. Uh, so in a training group with 15 adults, in Spain, three participants will feel uncomfortable with a Muslim or a Roma peer in the group. In France, two. Three in the Netherlands. In Hungary, more than half the group will be uncomfortable with either a Muslim or a Roma peer. So 
what does this mean? That really, like, we need to an acknowledge, we need to generate the interest in getting to know the other people, the other cultures, and uh, foster more inclusion, like being all part of this. Uh, in order to show you a little bit of more of the project, instead of just talking about it, I would ask to play the video, please. It's a video that was made by our partner in Amsterdam, uh, showing, uh, well, one of the workshops that they did. So yeah, this is. I thought this was a, a nice way of presenting a little bit more the project. So it starts from the from the past, from the museums, from the art, from the cultures that is coming from from our past, but bringing people together and talking about that and talking about uh, how, like, what are other cultures also bringing to the to the community. Okay, thank you. Maybe Eloise, can you tell us about What's the surprise? Juma, <laughs> um, could you open the document called Elan Interculturel? Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I would like to present you the project Draw Your Lines of Safety. And you can see that I am doing dissemination. <laughs> no. uh, so, Draw Your Lines of Safety is an European project that um, um, sorry, I lost my words. Um, uh, this project is exploring fruit mediation artistic challenges related to sexuality and anti um that young people face. So during two years, yes, we combining a thero theoretical and uh, practical ap approach. Uh, to develop activities um, to engage young people in these issues. Yes. <laughs> yes. So we created four manuals. Uh, the first is um, an online theoro theoretical, oh. <laughs> an online theoretical. Uh, manual about um, the origin of sexual violence 
and uh, we have a focus on perpetrators and it's just uh, text and um, you can find different expertise of uh, professional because we work with Italia, Hungary, uh, England and Netherlands. The second uh, manual is a toolkit so you can find theoretical part and also activities that you can do with young people. So it's about uh, the representation of victim and, and uh, perpetrator and on the media. And um, we try to have a focus on racism and xenophobia because in France, um, the machism and the sexual violence um, in the media is represented, I don't know how to say in English, but migrant and on migrant people. Uh, and we have a third manual called Intimate Interactional Empowerment and you can find a lot of uh, different activity to talk about consent for example and how to have a healthy relationship and um, we use like a theater activity, movement, voice and radio. And the last one is uh, how to create a campaign to promote to promote gender equality. So you can find different activities too. And um, I think, Louise, you have an important moment uh, related to uh, draw. Isn't yes, it? Yeah. thanks, Tony. Please, tell us more about it. So um, I would like to talk to you a little bit about the workshops that we did in, in Paris. So during one week, we brought together uh, 12 young women who didn't know each other. And uh, we tried to do a broadcast and a podcast together. So we used the artistic mediation and radio. So I would like to share to you just one activity that we did. So maybe, Tony, you can help me for translation. Okay. So we asked to the girl to... Um, Thank you. <laughs> it seems people, very yeah. simple. <laughs> and uh, after we uh, give them some instruction, like uh, put in the body your link uh, with sexuality, with power, with vulnerability. So they draw on the on the drawing. And after they have to exchange with the microphone and make interview about the work that they do. And it was a very strong moment and after we listen the voice together. So it just to show you like a concrete application of radio and art mediation that we used. Thank you. Antoine, would you like to share us a moment? You lived. Uh, with the radioactivity? Yep. Yeah, sure. Um, I can I I can talk to, uh, I can talk about uh, the last workshop I've done actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it was four days ago I think, and uh, I went with uh, another facilitator Tobias. We went to uh, in the suburb of France in the, in the suburb of Paris, uh, and uh, because uh, an association a local association. Uh, ask us to, to run a radio workshop. It's a local association which um, organizes activities uh, in, uh, in this suburb just to, because actually there's not a lot happen. So they do like simple actually um, activities like barbecue, football, uh, game, and, um, and it works. The association is doing a, a great job. So they, they told us uh, maybe you can, uh, you can come and do a workshop with, uh, the, with a, a man who have uh, children. And uh, so we went there and we were in, a, uh, in the building in a very small uh, room, uh, respecting of course all the, the, social the, the, the social distances, yes. and. Uh, uh, so we, we have done few activities. It was a bit a mess because the, the, the man, they were parents, so the kids were here okay. with them. So they were trying to, to say some things to the kids and stuff. And after a few activities, they just decided to talk about their parenthood. And it was very interesting because uh, uh, all the men, they were coming from different culture. 
uh, they were living in France, but uh, their parents were not born in France. So they were all coming from different uh, cultures and they were talking uh, all together about uh, what difficulties they face as a father who has a kid. And uh, they were very intimate. I think they didn't ha talk like that before together. So they were very intimate. One father was about to cry even. And it was very rich to listen to them. And, uh, and I thought it was very interesting because, of course, uh, I, I would say it was far from the stereotypes that we can have about people living in the suburb, about, uh, about father with kids, etc., etc. And they really liked doing it. So we've decided to come back and to do five podcasts with them and uh, to, to, to do five podcasts about being a father. And, of course, we will invite some experts to discuss with them. And, uh, and it's the beginning of something with them. And uh, it was very interesting. So it's a good moment. And I thought, wow, it's interesting because thanks to the radio, they have the possibility to talk together. Of course, they have in their life to talk together. But there, because of the radio, they've done it. So it brings some topics. They talk about it. And it was very rich. Okay, so. Thank you. Lot. And I think Daniela, too, has a recent uh, <laughs> moment to share with us? Uh, yes. Uh, well, actually, it's something that is just happened last Saturday. Um, we had the, well, La Chicha has two main uh, big performances uh, every year. One is called Forum Theater Marathon, and the other one is a masterclass of uh, Forum Theater. Uh, and just uh, last week, we had the, the marathon, which is called the marathon because it's actually like all day uh, presenting theater pieces one after the other uh, and involving the, the audience. As I was saying before, it's not just about presenting it, but also about creating a dialogue, a debate with, uh, with, um, with people that are assisting and participating, which we call SPECT actors. So they're not just spectators, but they're also actors. Um, this year, uh, this was like one of the events that we created uh, in the framework of another project, another European project, which is called COBU, which is about working uh, on the uh, like self-managed volunteers groups. So uh, training uh, people that are interested in, in our case, in uh, being theater facilitators in order to spread the impact that La Chicha cannot have by his own because we're, a, we're actually a very small team. So we need like, we felt the need to have more people that could uh, use the same methodology around the city and around the, the um, Catalonia. So uh, we trained 32 people to be facilitators, but in this case, in the marathon, they were actors and uh, like performing on stage. But what is the, the, the best thing about it? Why am I talking about it if they ask me about a good memory? Because it was the first event um, that we organized after the pandemic. It was the in, in Barcelona, we are still wearing masks in the, in the street. Uh, a lot of uh, reunion meetings are still forbidden uh, in order to respect the distances and so on. So this year, we contacted, well, with the help of the city council, we could uh, do this event in a park. So it was an open space in order to have people without a strict limitation of participants. And it blew our minds when we saw 130 people attending the, the event, and not only attending, like participating from four in the, morning, uh, in, the, in the afternoon until nine at night, and continuously participating. It was, um, we were focusing on uh, stereotypes and discrimination connected to the origins, so we were talking a lot about color, about accents, about languages, about how do people see us uh, according to the way we, we look. And it was just, um, just so wonderful to see how people were there, but to be part of it. Uh, so we don't only had the debates, but we always invite also people to interchange with an actor. 
So if like we are um, presenting a, a scene of oppression, then we ask people what we could do about it, what is happening, do you have this in your experience, have you seen it in your neighborhood? Can you change the situation? Come up to the stage if you like it and change it. Change the dialogue, change what society is talking about. And it was just like really, really good the, the way that people were participating and so many ideas that came out. So this is my most recent uh, <laughs> memory I wanted to share. Thanks a lot. Thank you for your answers all. And now the floor is yours. So is there any questions in the audience or on YouTube? Do you want to share a moment to you or <laughs> react to something that has been said? Okay, no one, <laughs> that's fine. In that case, I uh, will let Antoine uh, say a word before. Yes, just to tell you that uh, we are going to organize an event in Paris. So I just want to invite all the people who are looking at us on the internet and all the people of Vienna, of course. So we will organize a radio event uh, in Paris the 19th of September. Elan will be there also, will help us. And uh, during this event, you, you will have the possibility to listen to what I've talked about, to many uh, uh, programs which were uh, created by uh, people. And um, yeah, and it will give you a clue of how it's working because of course the program created by the people are very interesting to listen to. And uh, so come in Paris, 19th of September, you will listen some program of Radio Vita and also other programs. So you're welcome. Hey, we, we don't know yet. Maybe it will be online. Because now it's online and it looks pretty interesting, so why not? <laughs> yeah. And uh, just to say, um, if you want to talk with us after the meeting, don't hesitate. If you're not afraid by my English, <laughs> it's good. Okay. Thank you.
Test. Test, test. Test, test, test. Oh, leiser. Test, 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 test. Im Raum, ja, ich hab's rausgedreht gerade. Aber ich, ich meine, deinen Ton hast du? Hallo, guten Tag. Ich bin XY. Okay, ich versuche alles noch mal ein bisschen zu boosten. Hallo, guten Tag. Hallo. Test, 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 test. Test, 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 test. Vielleicht ist dieses Kabel auch irgendwie ein echtes Problem. Test, test, test. Test, test. 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 Ähm. Okay, warte mal. Test, test. Das ist ein bisschen besser. Ein bisschen besser. Test. Test, 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 Test. Okay. Okay. Hello everyone to our discussion panel, um, Centered on Centered Voices. Um, I want to welcome you live guests, but also our um, online participator and watcher. Um, yeah, before I present my guest, I would like to briefly say something about the course of the discussion. Um, after, a so uh, after, a f after a short presentation, of my dear two guests. Um, you will be able to ask questions, yeah, so um, be ready for that. And also to our online audience, you will be also able to ask questions, so leave your comments and then we will get them. Um, yeah, and also if you feel like asking in German, that's actually not a problem at all. We can, I guess, we can answer that as well. Um, to my right, I would like to welcome Smiranda Krings. She works in different contexts with, uh, in art and culture sector and is co-initiator in of Question Me and Answer. To that, you'll say something later. And I also want to welcome my other guest, uh, Tonika Hunter, curator, 
culture educator and DJ from London, has been based in Vienna since 2014. Um, she has co-funded and created for um, collectives which focus on um, arts and creating um, inclusive and intersectional spaces for artistic productions and um, consumptions. So, Smiranda, I would like you to start to make your presentation, please. Uh -huh. Thank you. Sure. Um, maybe you can turn it on. Good. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, my name is Miranda. Luna said that already. I'd like to introduce myself also shortly. Um, what I will be presenting is our project question and answer that Justina, who's sitting here in the red dress and may have been running for two years, um, maybe to give you a context what it is even about. Question and answer started actually 2015, informally kind of. Uh, some of you maybe know the artist Osama Zatar. Back then we were working together um, in an association in Vienna dealing with uh, um, social work for refugees basically and housing. Um, and um, when many people came in 2015 to Vienna. And uh, he's an artist and was very interested in art and I thought, well, we'd like to know what kind of artist came to Vienna, right? So um, what we did is that we organized uh, a party <laughs> Basically, it's very simple. Uh, and invited lots of artists that were new to Vienna. Um, and uh, the idea was to kind of get them in touch with the Austrian uh, cultural sector and for them to get connections, to know who to talk to, who to um, maybe create a band with, make music with, like this. Um, and this was kind of run for a couple of years informally, a little, hey, do you know someone? Um, and then I got together with Justina to do this um, really formally uh, as part of an association uh, and with a website and everything. So what we do now is that we implement different programs that support artists that are new to Vienna in navigating uh, the Viennese cultural sector. And uh, the first program and the most well known and biggest program is the Artist Collective. Where do I have to push in the direction? Yes. Uh, the QMA Artist Collective. Um, we're now working with the fourth collective already, so quite some experience with that already. And basically what we do um, is that there's an open call for artists that are new to Vienna, but also for artists who have been living in Vienna for a very long time. And what we do then is that we pair them up. So there's one artist working together, uh, one artist that is new to Vienna, working together with an artist that, just, uh, that has been living in Vienna for a long, long time. Uh, and they create an artwork together over several months. And during these months, we also organize uh, events, like um, networking events for them to get to know the other people in the collective, uh, for them to get to know different um, cultural actors in Vienna, to really build up their own network. Because normally, I mean, many of us are in the cultural sector. If you're new to Vienna, it just takes a really long time if you don't know anyone yet. Where do you go? Who do you ask? Who can you even approach? Um, and also um, events for learning. So what does the market look like? For example, um, Florian, I don't know if he's here, um, he uh, runs an online gallery, not only online, but mainly online gallery. Uh, and we had a talk there, for example, two weeks ago on how is the uh, art market being digitalized? Um, w what potential does he see? How can artists uh, get into this sector? So our artists also get to, get to learn all kinds of different skills. Um, so just some impressions from the last exhibitions, because at the end of, of their co-working, we always exhibit uh, what they did. Um, each uh, pair is also assigned a curator, so there are multiple curators working on this whole process. Um, some of the past artists, I thought maybe you see some names that you know, so you can put it in some kind of context. These are the artists we're currently working with, uh, 16 very cool artists, we're really excited at the moment. It's a lot of fun. Um, so much for this project. We're like, that, hmm? oh, he's reading. Yeah, you want to read? Okay. Yeah, so, uh, um, Huda, who has uh, won the Kunsthalle Prize, is one of the artists who's been who's established in Vienna already. Um, yeah, some maybe to the target group of this also more. So basically, um, the people who are new to Vienna are mostly are migrants and refugees, but in the last years, more and more migrants, um, because in the cultural sector in Vienna, uh, there are not that many people with a refugee background 
in the culture sector or that have applied to us, like maybe they just didn't apply. Um, but mainly we're working with people from Iran. And there are quite a lot of people from Iran at the moment, right? Also last year, um, I would say, yeah. Then we try to also do a lot of promotion for these artists to get them in magazines, stuff like this, for them to get them also be presented. Um, these are the, the guided tours that we organize for them. So we have some partners that give us guided tours for free. And we go and visit museums together, get to know the curators there. So look at this. Um, and the second program um, is QMA on stage. Muita, probably many of you know him. <laughs> Muita knows everyone. Uh, and um, this is actually uh, his project that I will be shortly presenting because he's not in Vienna at the moment. Um, he implemented this project as part of our association, but really took the lead on this. Uh, so for those that don't know Muita in this room, Muita is a musician um, in, based in Vienna. And um, his idea for many years has been to develop some kind of program that would support uh, migrant musicians uh, in having easier access to the music scene. So what uh, he developed together with us is a kind of a prize, a showcase event, where every year there's an open call for artists, to, uh, for musicians to apply. And from this open call, um, a group of jury members then select the three or four most promising artists. And uh, what happens then is that they get fancy prizes uh, that are really just aimed at um, supporting them also financially, uh, but in terms of like real uh, goods. So there's a video um, production, there's a photo shooting with also people that are very well known in the scene. So again, we have this aspect of networking that they, when they do a photo shooting together with Gabriel Huyden, they get to know this guy, all the people around him. So it's really like working together means getting to know their surrounding also, right? Um, so um, this is kind of, it, it's very simple. We give away prizes um, and the people that win them just can work further with that. So it's just a boost for a couple of artists. It's not changing the world, obviously, but for these couple artists that win, it's nice. And, um, um, and it gives uh, also an opportunity to, I mean, what, who we target a lot with this project is bookers, obviously. So we do a lot of promotion um, in the music scene. Uh, luckily, Muita knows a lot of these people, so it's very easy for us to really approach them directly and say, listen, I know you don't um, get in diverse musicians in your programs normally, but these four were selected by a jury of people that you also like, that you trust, whose music taste you trust, and they're good, so just take them. Um, and uh, last year, since we couldn't do it uh, online, uh, we couldn't do it in person, uh, we produced short videos where each of the winning artists uh, introduced themselves. Um, which was also really nice because uh, the bookers could also kind of get an idea of who these artists were without having to meet them, without having to, I don't know, make a meeting with them and actually meet in person. Um, yeah. Does this still work? Yeah, maybe just some photos of the winners. Um, yeah. And just a fun project we do on the side, because Justina and I like working with kids, um, is we <laughs> do a kid summer, um, where for a week long we give opportunities to artists that are new to Vienna to teach art to kids. So it's a one week kids program that is also up again on the 12th of July, and we still have free spots. Mm -hmm. It's a one week program. Um, and the idea is also that half of the kids um, are kids uh, with, um, that are Austrian, have been born here, whose parents were born here, and the other half are the kids that maybe would not uh, go to the same schools as, as the other kids. So there are also um, different pricing schemes um, so that everyone can participate. This year we're doing it in Florida stuff, actually. Um, yeah. Uh, 8 to 13. Yeah. So I'm open for questions. I think you just ask me whatever seems interesting to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess before we take the questions, I would also introduce to you Tonika. Would you like to? Yeah. I forgot I had a mic. Um, <laughs> first of all, uh, thanks a lot, Miranda, for the presentation. And I, moving to Vienna 2014, didn't know anybody. And I think if I'd known or there was an, exi an existing organization like Question Me and Answer, I would have glided much more easier into the scene. So um, congratulations on that initiative. It's really an important one. And um, I think that uh, don't underestimate the, the importance or the, 
the politics of a party, like to actually get people together and music to get people together into an environment where they're relaxed and comfortable and feel safe um, as a very important like networking tool as well. So I, actually, I started um, my projects with partying, more or less. They continue with partying sometimes, but um, I started off um, doing my own events at uh, Club Titanic in Teobald Gasse, and this party series was called On Fleek, and it was my way actually of getting to know a lot of people um, within the cultural, the artistic scene. And it then led me, through music, led me to doing curation of music and different visual arts and kind of was my introduction to the, the Austrian cultural scene, which is very difficult, as you said, especially the, uh, the Viennese cultural scene, I guess we're specifically talking about, to get, um, to get into and to be welcome into. So, um, yeah, great, brilliant initiative. And I'm here today in the context of, I'm doing different projects. Um, uh, right now, for the Symposium for the Arts, Sherry and Bashi invited me to uh, present a project of mine which I started last summer called Reading the Radical. And this is an audio project which essentially asks um, four to five individuals to write and or read um, either a self-written piece or pieces of text, prose, poetry, um, rap lyrics, um, manifesto, whatever they feel moved to. Uh, to, to read that basically reflects where they're at or things that they're interested in or something that's on their heart. So that's the, the, the broad concept and I asked them to, um, to read on the, to the topic is up to them. So they choose what topic they'd like to talk on. But the political, the radical in it is that I try to deliberately center or I do deliberately center people who are not always in the limelight. So a lot of the time they do another profession and they're kind of put on the spot to write and to read something very personal to them. And I think the radical or the political in that is that they have the space to read or, or say what's on their heart. So um, it's a very simple concept, which I really grown to love because it actually gives a platform to many different voices. Yes, in terms of audio project, but also perspectives and opinions. Um, and yesterday, who was here yesterday, actually? More or less everyone, okay, cool. Um, uh, yesterday, the, the the iteration that I did for for D-Arts, um, as I said, usually the content, the co topics come from the readers themselves, but for D-Arts, um, this time I actually asked them to focus on the four round table you know, um, topics. So community building, uh, policy making, uh, artistic production, and Kunst und Kulturvermittlung, so artistic education um, and outreach. And um, I would like to play one of the readings of Uldus Amatze. Uh, she's a dancer. <laughs> she's a dancer and um, she's an amazing, amazing artist. Um, and her reading is on the topic of diversity policy making. Or, as she titled, Why Diversity Policy Doesn't Work. Bei der Aufnahmeprüfung der Universität für Angewandte Kunst der Stadt Wien wurde ich von einer Professorin gefragt, wie fühlt sich es für sie eigentlich an, hier frei zu sein? Ich dachte mir, was meint sie mit der Freiheit genau? Jahrelang hatte ich verschiedenste Konzepte für Kunstprojekte bei Förderstellen eingereicht. Keines meiner Projekte würde gefordert. Dann kam 2015 die Flüchtlingswelle. Ich reiche eine Arbeit mit den neuen Eingekommenen ein. Ich kriege die Förderung. Bam. Erste Emotion. Tränen sprudeln. Ich denke, das ist es, was sie von mir erwarten. Ich würde in eine Institution eingeladen, welche Vielfalt unterstützen möchte, um einen Tanzworkshop zu halten. Persischen Tanz soll ich unterrichten. Ich freue mich und mache es gerne. Nur werde ich immer wieder für die gleiche Richtung eingeladen, traditionelle persische Tanz, obwohl mein Fokus auf zeitgenössische Kunst liegt. Ich merke, um zeitgenössischen Tanz zu unterrichten, werden hauptsächlich europäische TanzlehrerInnen eingeladen. Mir kommen die Emotionen hoch. Ich werde als Vorzeigestudentin vorgestellt und eingeladen, im Radio in der Sendung Talentbörse an einem Interview teilzunehmen. Die meiste Zeit werde ich darüber befragt, wie ich mit meiner Situation als Künstlerin im Iran und mit meiner sogenannten Freiheit in Österreich umgehe. Es bleibt wenig Zeit für die Kunst selbst, meinen individuellen Fokus und meine Interessen. So stellte sich mir die Frage, lebe ich eine fremdbestimmte Identität? 
In meiner 13 Jahren Aufenthalt in Österreich waren es nicht wenig ähnliche Erfahrungen, die mir Schritt für Schritt klar machen sollten, dass ich anders sei. Ich habe also gelernt, wie ich durch mein Anderssein Aufmerksamkeit, Unterstützung und Arbeitsmöglichkeiten bekommen kann. Dadurch zeichnet sich rückblickend betrachtet unsichtbare, subtile Linien, welche eine fremdbestimmte Identität konstruieren. Als Frau Iranerin Orientale in einer westlichen Gesellschaft, als Migrantin und Feministin bin ich eine Projektionsfläche für so viele Themen und Ideen. Manche der für mich benutzten Kategorien kann ich wählen. Viele anderen werden mir übergestülpt. Manchmal, wenn ich über Freiheit nachdenke, werde ich von Wut überwältigt. Wo ist die tatsächliche Freiheit der Kunst in Europa, die ich mir erhofft hatte? Darf ich mich als Iranerin zum Beispiel auch einfach nur für abstrakte Formen, Punkte und Linien interessieren, ohne dabei politisiert, exotisiert und orientalisiert zu werden? Ist es zu viel gewollt, mir zu wünschen, einzig und alleine als Kunstschaffende wahrgenommen zu werden, unabhängig von meiner Herkunft und dafür anerkannt und möglicherweise unterstützt zu werden? Nach meiner Auswanderung hat sich auch die Frage nach der Zielgruppe meiner Kunst ganz neu gestellt. Für wen produziere ich eigentlich? Wen will ich erreichen? Wer bin ich eigentlich? Wer bestimmt, auf welche Art und Weise, für wen ich Kunst produzieren soll? Welche Themen sind für welches Publikum vorgedacht und vorprogrammiert? Für wen möchte ich eigentlich Kunst produzieren? Für Peter und Dina? Für Hassan und Mina? Für mich? Für eine utopische Gesellschaft, in welcher alle Menschen die gleichen Privilegien genießen? Die Gedanken an Freiheit im Kunst werden komplexer, wenn ich an die sogenannte Diversity Politik praktiziert in Österreich denke. Zweifel tauchen auf. Werde ich immer noch von der Diversity Politik unterstützt, wenn ich nicht entweder die Erwartungen erfülle oder mich darüber aufrege, sondern einfach nur meinen Interessen bezüglich Kunst, insbesondere Tanz, nachgehe? Werde ich auch wahrgenommen, wenn ich nicht das Bild anspreche, welches es rechtfertigt, eine Frau aus dem Iran hier eine Bühne und Öffentlichkeit geben? Was wäre ohne die moralische Genugtuung, dass man es diese arme Iranerin ermöglicht hat, sich künstlerisch auszudrücken und ihr endlich die erhoffte Freiheit geschenkt hat? Bin ich immer noch interessant, wenn ich nicht mehr die Opfer, die Kämpferin oder die Heldin repräsentiere? Werde ich immer noch zu Fachgespräche, Sendungen oder Festivals eingeladen, wenn ich nicht als Exotin betrachtet und deswegen ausgewählt werde? Werde ich immer noch Förderungen bekommen, wenn meine Themen nicht mit meiner Herkunft oder meinem Geschlecht zu tun haben? Die Zweifel werden mehr. Bin ich überhaupt in der Lage, gleich wertvolle Kunst zu produzieren, wenn ich mich auf unpolitische Interessensgebiete konzentriere, zum Beispiel auf eine bestimmte Ästhetik, ohne mich dabei mit aktuellen gesellschaftlichen Themen beschäftigt zu haben? Würde mich die Diversity Politik immer noch unterstützen oder bin ich dann uninteressant? Ich denke weiter. Aber ich interessiere mich doch für das politische, für gesellschaftliche Themen. Ich will damit arbeiten. Ich möchte für Gerechtigkeit kämpfen. Was macht mich dann so wütend, traurig und nachdenklich? Ich habe einen langen Weg hinter mir. Zuerst gutgläubig und jung habe ich versucht, meine Herkunft nicht als Aushängeschild zu verwenden, nicht deshalb Aufmerksamkeit, Unterstützung und Anerkennung zu bekommen. Ich glaubte an wahre, authentische und universelle Freiheit in der Kunst für alle. Vielleicht gibt es sie für niemanden. Ich würde immer wieder enttäuscht und in diese Enttäuschung bestätigt, als ich meine erste Förderung überhaupt mit einem Projekt mit und über geflüchtete Menschen bekommen habe. Danach hat sich der Gurt immer enge schnürend angefühlt, als ich bemerkte, dass sogar wenn ich mich bewusst dagegen stelle, mein Aussehen und mein Körper weiterhin diese Projektionen anziehen. Jetzt ist die Frage, wie kann die Diversity Politik praktiziert werden, um das Ziel, eine wertschätzende Grundhaltung 
im Umgang mit der Vielfalt einzelner Personen als auch Personengruppen Nähe zu kommen, ohne die betroffenen Personen dabei in ihrem Hintergrund und ihrem Geschichte einzusperren. Auch ich habe darauf keine klaren und einfachen Antworten. Die Widersprüche von Normalisierung bei gleichzeitigem Hervorheben von strukturellen Benachteiligungen oder Zuschreibungen werden nicht einfach verschwinden. Doch ich bin bereit, der Komplexität zu begegnen und möchte dabei helfen, Strategien für den Kunst- und Kulturbetrieb in Österreich auszuarbeiten, um echte Inklusion zu leben. Ich möchte mit einem Zitat von Hannah Arendt enden. Was ist Freiheit und was bedeutet sie uns? Begreifen wir sie nur als die Abwesenheit von Furcht und Zwänge oder meint Freiheit vielmehr auch, sich an gesellschaftlichen Prozessen und Regierungsgeschäften zu beteiligen, eine eigene politische Stimme zu haben, um von anderen gehört, erkannt und schließlich erinnert zu werden? Und haben wir diese Freiheit einfach oder wer gibt sie uns? Und kann man sie auch wieder wegnehmen? Dieser Ausschnitt stammt aus ihrem Buch »Die Freiheit frei zu sein«. Ich hoffe, mein Beitrag hinterlässt euch nachdenklich und mit Lust zum Wandeln. Lasst uns die Freiheit, die wir haben, nützen und pflegen. That was Uldus Amatsede, uh, an amazing performer, dancer, artist. And she's usually seen, thank you for taking the time to listen to that actually. She's usually seen um, in a very present way as a dancer and expressing through her, her body and her movement. Um, and I think I deliberately asked her to be part of the readings because I've worked with her in several different um, contexts and she's always got so much to say. And, um, but she never has the platform to say it in, in that way. So I was really happy to have her write. And she was like, I'm not a writer, Tanika. I, I don't write. I don't usually do this kind of things. But she really had so much to say that I, I was really glad she could be part of it. And um, yeah, I think that this platform is something that I will continue because it really has opened up um, for people, as I said, that are not always in the limelight in the way that this puts them in the limelight in a very personal way. And um, they also get a chance to reflect on themselves and also cause reflection in others. And that's what this, this project is about. So thank you for listening as well. Thank you too for both of you. Thank you Sveran and thank you Tunika for the little presentation. And like now when, when I was listening to it, I was like, oh my God, some of those things, like when she entered to the university and stuff, Actually, it happened to me too. Like, you know, I, I, I remember sitting there, people waiting for me to get married, you know, be because originally, like, I'm from Syria because everyone wants to go to this big fancy wedding where I'll be like, you know, the bride with this huge wedding dress and everyone can, like, you know, dance and with the, you know, dabka and everything. Uh, and it's, um, I don't know, and always those strange questions that they used to ask, but, well... That's behind me now, somehow. Um, well, the first question, I mean, like now, everyone is invited to, you know, ask questions anytime, raise your hand. Um, my, ah, yes, of course. I actually forgot to ask if anyone, does, any, does everyone want to speak German? Was there anyone that needs a little broad translation of what was said? Please don't feel shy if you do. No, okay, cool. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, yeah, well, uh, whenever you like to, you know, ask a question, my colleague will come with a mic. You can actually, you should better, like, you know, keep the mask on and then ask the question. Yeah. Um, my, fr I'll start the uh, discussion. Um, my first question is uh, for you, Miranda. What were the big challenges you faced at the beginning when you started? Um, question me and answer. Um, well, I think it's basic challenges that one faces when one does cultural projects that you have to get money, you have to get people involved, not being able to pay them a lot, which is just, you feel shit doing it, but uh, you have to get people involved because otherwise you can't grow, right? So um, that's a challenge for sure, but maybe more on the, um, on the, layer of uh, ideas and what it's about and the theoretical background. Of course, it's also um, a challenge to kind of see how the artists interact 
and the curating is also, I guess, I mean, I don't, that's not my topic in the project, um, but there are always challenges with this because people don't know each other before. The artists that are part of the program, they get to know each other through the program. So also the artists who've been in Vienna for a long, long time, they're not from um, some leftist bubble where you know how to speak and what, uh, what norms there are to make people feel included uh, in discussions like this. Mm -hmm. So obviously it's also um, interesting to work on the topic of um, migrant artists, although that's not really a topic, but they're included in this obviously, and it's th that's the target group uh, with a group of Austrian artists that maybe don't really know many people that are new to Vienna. And they just grew up differently, right? Their entire surrounding are maybe Austrian people who've been living here for a very long time. So um, that's also an interesting uh, thing to see how also the mindset changes. Of course, if you don't know many people at the beginning, you have uh, uh, what Uldus was also talking about, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, exoticizing of artists mm -hmm. who are new to Vienna. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I mean, this is something very, um, natural or many people just do it if they don't know people from other cultures and they kind of just project stuff on them. It's also an interesting way to um, navigate it and a challenge definitely. Thank you. What about you? Like Challenges? What, yes. Um, many. Like uh, financial is one aspect. I think there's existential, <laughs> psychological. Um, no, but th th I think the challenge is for me in my work, reading the radical is one concept of many things that I do, or one project of many things that I do. But pff, the challenges are making space for. So the diversity conversation is very new in Austria and it's very old in other parts of the world. But um, so the challenge is to. Pff, get beyond a very basic understanding of what diversity is um, in terms of not looking at others and creating distance and othering people and difference, but understanding that people have, different people have very different experiences and experience the world in, in di different ways because of their skin color or religion or gender. And um, that unfortunately there are, there's discrimination based on different factors, which is why intersectionality is also important. So there's a challenge of First of all, getting to a level of conversation of what diversity should actually try to achieve. Then there's how we include diverse people. And then there's what I think is a step beyond which is to empower diverse people. So for me, my challenge or my goal is to always um, find a way, not just for myself, but to open up a path for others. So it's always, okay, there's this institution or this person who wants to book me or wants me to curate something. But I'm always thinking, how can I how can I actually open that up to others? As a curator, naturally, of course, I'll ask other artists and producers, etc. but it's always a question of pushing the budget, pushing the program a little bit more. Like most of the time I'm asked to do something as an individual, one thing as part of a program is already preconceived, and I'll always try to push to have my own concept within that. So I have to make space for myself and then make space for others so that there's a kind of empowerment of myself so that I can also uh, bring up other BPOC or QT BPOC. So that's my main challenge to actually broaden a little bit the mindset of those who ask me to do something, to think, okay, this is one project for, or one film or one DJ set, but how can we sustainably include people um, of diverse backgrounds? Yeah, like pushing the limits a little bit more so the next time you can step, you know, and start somewhere else where you're like further and further beyond. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Firstly, thank you. Those are really interesting um, presentations and projects. And Tanika, I wanted to follow up on that because I was also wondering what strategies you've come up with personally as a curator, let's say for this project that you just explained, mm -hmm. to go really far down, let's say, the hierarchy of people that are normally presented. So how do you find people that are not just used as tokens, let's say, in Austria, but how are you doing research to figure out and, uh, and explore the many artists that are truly unseen? I mean, of course, you can speak to your friends and you can speak to this person or that person, but how do you dig even deeper? Because I think that's hard for everyone to, to achieve. Yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, I, I think way before I even started to curate, 
as an individual moving to Vienna, not knowing anyone, and also being a black queer person moving from a big city of London to the tiny Vienna, I actively was engaging with finding community, finding spaces that were safe, and realizing that in Austria and in Vienna there were not spaces that were offered that were like that. So having to create, then create those spaces. Um, I still think, I still come across new artists, new creatives every day, every week, and I, that's, ex that's the exciting part of my work. Um, how do I dig a little bit deeper? I mean, I do actively a lot of research online. I do a lot of uh, new friends of, of friends, um, going to a lot of exhibitions myself, but also trying to go to the off spaces, to get not go to institutions and also work within off spaces. So a lot of um, what I do, there was a project a couple of years back, 2019, that I did at a space called Anatole and Schnitzel, which is like a... Um, it's actually a, it's an imbis, as the name actually suggests. Uh, it was a schnitzel takeaway place. And um, they were offering like a submission meter so you can take over the rent for a month. And then I like did an open call for that area, but then also asked friends of friends of anyone who'd be interested to exhibit and met a lot more people through that collective that were doing the, the space, but then also met a lot of people through the open call. So it's a, it's a, it's a constant work to find people that are unseen, unheard, but also my work is to provide the platform when I do find them and then they also, that's an inspiration to find others that are also seeking this kind of space. And it's a project I did with uh, Stan129 last, uh, last summer, was it last? Yeah, 2020 yeah. is a blur, wow. Yeah. Well, it was never there actually. What? Somehow, it's know? like it didn't <laughs> exist, yeah. But it, pr it was very present at the same time, weird. Um, so Stan129 was also a space for me that was really important that is embedded within community, that it's not these centralized um, white wall institutions, they're very much, oh, thank you, nice. <laughs> community, this is how we work. So yeah, exactly, so offering a space um, that are not the centralized, very elitist ways of, of finding artists and also showing that people can access art, like community should be, have access to art in a way that they wake up and it's around the corner or you know we actually exhibited um, like through the so this project was possible because even though it was opening after the lockdown it was um, presenting works from inside the space outside so they've got the huge windows and uh, we had uh, a pop-up in there a hair pop-up looking at the, the story of uh, black hair story and black history through hair we had Ina Adwan doing um, a photo exhibition presented through the w window. So it was about reintegrating its community post lockdown, several waves, and also about like reintegrating and understanding what, how important culture is for community. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, actually cur curating also in off spaces is a way that I also find and hopefully attract and um, and work with other artists, you know, by not being in these centralized, clear, obvious spaces. Thank you. Is there any other question? No? Okay. So, um, Smiranda, for you, question. Um, how do you, um, how should I say, I mean, like those open calls you do, how do you try to find those new artists who are maybe not so, um, not so embed in the in the art and cultural scene. Um, as Tunika was saying, it's just a lot of research. Um, I put together a really long list. Of like, do you really write them? You know, s stalk yeah. them on Instagram yeah. and on, yeah. yeah, like <laughs> totally um, on Facebook more. I'm, I'm not on Instagram, unfortunately, or fortunately. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I just add people on Facebook. Like, I know you're an artist, okay, and then I invite them to the open call. Um, and um, it works. And it's really the way you've got to do it because I think a lot of people are also maybe feel shy when they're new to a city. They don't feel like maybe, it's, maybe it doesn't seem approachable, the project that we're doing from the design or whatever. So it's really about getting people, um, getting their attention by just really contacting them. I write emails to people. I find their email address somewhere on their website and then just write them, hey, I, I found your website today. Don't you want to apply? Um, and also, uh, obviously, we're in touch with organizations that work with refugees who are new to Vienna, uh, not in the arts field, but just that provide basic services. And they always share the open call. So if somebody... So they know someone. Exactly, they could, exactly. Okay, they could spread it pretty fast. Um, we both, I mean, like you both talked about a little bit, like, you know, about financing. I mean, art is not for free, and it should be, you know, get paid. 
how do you think um, all those um, scholarships and you know the financing from the government should change so that you know unseen or unheard artists could also have access to money um, for me, having experience recently so I didn't apply for funding for a few years actually when I first got here because I was kind of put off by how it's it's really difficult and also as a non-native German speaker it's very intimidating it's very um, a lot of legal a lot of very like hard language um, and so it put me off and I had a point to this point was um, that I lost my point actually <laughs> um, yes and therefore now that I this year last year for the first time uh, applied for BM Kurs and looking for funding there and in the requirements they most of the time are asking um, not lay personas and so not lay persons or individuals but usually you have to be tied to Varian or an organization or a company even better so they have some I think for me this, the structural obstacles are still that as an individual, so imagine you are a refugee or even as a black Austrian or as a migrant, some of a migrant background or biography, um, I think that it's still very inaccessible because if you're not tied to a bigger organization, you don't have the background or the CV or the awards or whatever it is to get to be actually taken seriously, your application to be taken seriously, then there's still a very structural, structural obstacle uh, that are very... I, I, since I've lived here, instead of lived and worked in Vienna almost seven years, I think things have opened up. Question me and answer me. Uh, question me and answer is a good example. There are other funds and other support systems like Kucha um, you know, even Stan, for example. You know that I know they've got funding for smaller projects and things like this. And I think on that level, it does allow people to apply. That's a much more friendly and much more um, accessible way of applying for funding. But on the institutional structural level, it's very alienating actually still. It's always scary, to be honest. Like, I also apply like for funding, and every time I download those sheets, I was like, oh my god, what are you going to do? And then like those numbers, and then those Excel sheets, and it's always so scary, and then I really have to take all the power that I have to really sit and say, okay, you're not going to move until it's done. And sometimes it doesn't really work, but <laughs> at least I try. Um, I would say it's uh, there's a quite a solution that I would just propose for this is that we just need quotas um, for public funding. Um, and uh, at the moment, the public funds uh, are divided in such a way that they really go a lot to, to Austrians whose families have been here for many generations. Um, and uh, and I, I don't know how many of you know the program of Kultur Gemma, but they give stipends to oh, five artists a year for half a year. It's basically like the uh, the stipends from the BKA, um, but um, but they just give it to artists. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what the city of Vienna is doing is that whenever a migrant artist applies, this is what they tell me, what I've heard from artists around, they say, well, um, while you're applying with us, you can just apply for Kultur Gema. So basically it's like, a, just like go there. Dividing <laughs> it. Like but it's only five stipends a year, so I mean, it's not really yeah, anything it's, substantial. It's, yeah. Uh, but it's like a good uh, excuse for them. Just go there. Um, and this is kind of what's happening. So we just need a quota that a certain percentage need to be people who haven't been with their families living here for 300 years. And, uh, and I mean, something that came up yesterday in one of the discussions was um, that the jury members I mean, like it's it's not it's not so transparent, you know. It you, you don't really know how much money goes where and who gets it, and when it comes to you know the big institutions. But then also, um, you always find the same names again and again because it gives them like somehow legitimacy, you know. Oh my God, she got this, uh, so he's gonna get that, and so um, it's really hard for someone who is new and maybe did not get all the awards and who does not have a legitimacy to really come and apply and it like despite from the german part and the bureaucracy that you have to fill but still um i think also like unfortunately diversity is really still seen or being inclusive in terms of like how funds are allocated to diverse people or diverse projects is still very much seen in a very like quantitative way so like quotas even though they're important like i feel like they 
sometimes also essentialize how do you actually do that without categorizing again or classifying like which groups deserve or should get what because I, even when you think about like I think the conversation of diversity in Austria for the main part still very much stays on men and women which is just like wow there's so many spectrum of not only gender but this is I feel like when they say 60% women in the organization, they feel that that's enough, and that's enough in terms of diversity. So I don't even think they're even there yet to have a conversation on how to make sure that funding is allocated in a way that's even inclusive properly to understand the reality of people's existence. So it's a very long way away, but I, and I also don't have the answer, but um, yeah, I, I also don't know about quotas either, if that's the... the, the if that's the way, only yeah, within the context of Austria, I think it's a, a bigger conversation. Yeah. Uh, we have a question in the audience. Yesterday, you also uh, talked about data, data that is missing. Mm -hmm. oh, Sorry, I hope that was not me. <laughs> so, data that is missing, and actually in Germany and, and in other countries, they are starting to collect this data, although many think it's not allowed to do so, but without this data, we will not be able to, to have any quota. And um, also to add, I mean, who are these people that are sitting in these institutions, in foundations, who are the, like, we need also diversity there, we need people with diverse background who sit in the boards and who decide on where the money goes. So this is also, again, another level of, of where I think we need to fight for more people. Me personally, I work also for a foundation, and, and this is also what I really try to fight for internally when uh, new people are hired, that they have a diverse background, because else it's not going to change. Thank you. I think the, the, the staff and the staffing and the hiring processes is where it absolutely needs to start because we, I did a project in 2018 with Kutrin and Bewegung actually with, it was a Creative Europe project, so funded by the EU, and a consortium of Germany, Austria and, Germany, Austria and Belgium, Belgium. thank you. And um, we did a mapping research of cultural, inter I actually brought maybe five, five copies of these on the piano, um, of the of the mapping we did. So it was um, mapping of cultural institutions and looking at um, both quantitative data, so surveys that asked about the three three areas: so personnel, so staff, uh, programming, how the the content and um, their content is done, and the public, so how they not yeah, yeah how they basically make sure that a diverse public is able to have access to the artworks or the institution. The audience. Exactly, audience, yeah. So um, we did this in Austria and uh, yeah, it was quantitative in the survey and then it was qualitative that we did um, interviews of what we called gatekeepers. So at the very senior level, um, we interviewed the head of Welt Museum or so, so and so and so. And um, as you can imagine, the, the, the results, which you will read in Austria were a little bit, a bit disappointing, but not surprising. But I think one of my main you know, one of my main conclusions from this is that the, the conversation, the understanding of diversity in Austria is very, very quantitative, that we do need this data, but the, the ticking off of boxes of we have this many women or we have this many languages isn't actually enough. So it really only went on a certain level and the amount of institutions that didn't even want to respond to the survey was already an indication of this, no one's really ready to have that conversation yet. But I definitely agree that a, a, a starting point, which is why at the beginning of this I talked about empowerment, is to allow BPOC or diverse people to be in positions, decision-making positions, to be able to even think in these ways. So, um, yeah. And where do you see, like, for example, the responsibility in cultural educational institutions? Because we heard in Urdu's, um, um, you know, the reading, that she was also talking about the Angewandte. And so where do you think, what, what does have to change there in order for people who are new here to, you know, be also free to do the work that they would like to do? That does not have to be about, like, you know, identity or being from the Orient, from Iran? I, I didn't study here, so I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't have direct experience of um, the educational system here, but the same things that I'm talking about in the institutions, uh, actually, this study did not, and we thought about it afterwards, include educational institutions. And we wondered why we didn't approach Angevante and Bilimbo, um, 
but um, I hear the same the same issues about the the unbefristed um, kind of contracts of professors that are still white or what is it male pale and stale. And we um, don't even have so many women, like to be honest. Sorry, so, and I mean, like I the, the last time I um, I was talking about this with a friend, and then now I went to the website to see. Like I, I studied graphic design at the University of Applied Arts, so then we went to the website to see like. Um, who did go? Who did change? You know, who are the new people there? And then I discovered, oh my God, it's still like the same stuff like ten years ago. Same people. They changed maybe one man with the other, but that's it. And but actually, the cultural discussion changed. You know, like one of the artists I saw on your list was Ramira Wong, who was fighting a lot for non-EU and outside the EEA students' rights, said, is it Andy yeah. yeah, and he, it's, it's also nice to see him on the list because he's a great artist, but um, you know, the, the, at the time there were conversations on the student rights of, of, of like Austrian students and there was much more focus on this than actually the non-EEA students and how they finding it difficult, some people to pay their fees and things like this, so I think there's just an imbalance entirely of, of, um, in the educational system also. You have a question, right? From the audience, from the online from audience. The audience. Not from the, not from the my, my Ah, okay, okay, you're gone. <laughs> Myself as a participant. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to, to add that I think um, universities, art universities, just are on the same um, level of institutional failure as funding institutions are. Um, like Asma um, Ayat, who's going to have a conversation after this one. Um, She's studying at Angewandte. And, Bildende. Uh, a Bildende, sorry. And I think she will sh also shed light on this. And um, I, I know hor horrific stories from uh, MUK, um, Musik und Kunst Universität. Um, and really like uh, students trying to, you know, um, from collectives to somehow um, install an anti-discrimination workshop for all um, teaching people there because like stereotypes being reproduced and reproduced and reproduced and um, I mean it's it's why is why I think uh, this institutional level is so interconnected is that uh, in many um, you know um, Ausschreibungen calls um, you need to in order to apply you need this formal um, education, this formal art education, uh, you have to have like some proof of, I don't know, diploma. And um, so actually you can only access this public money when having, like, when having gone through this institutionalized, uh, sorry, but discriminatory, discriminatory and racist process. And you've actually um, somehow um, been teached this, yeah, institutionalized, assimil assimilated um, art stuff. And <laughs> I don't know, like, I don't know whether I, make, I can make myself clear at the moment, but I think it's, it's really um, a, a big problem and, uh, yeah. And I would like to add something to this, that a lot of the students also, like, even if they get in, then when they start, they sometimes just do not feel comfortable at all. And then they never really finish. So then we have this problem again with like not being able to apply or to you know. um, I can definitely speak to that personally because I studied at the building and at the art academy and I did finish luckily but um, but when I started I was in a class that was very Austrian it was an Austrian teacher and I'd say 90% of the students at least were Austrian and I was new, I mean, this was 2005, so I felt I hadn't fully integrated, so to speak, but it was so toxic for me, this atmosphere. There was so much, um, the, that professor, in my opinion, had gotten the job because he was such good friends with people uh, in higher up places, and then I think that that, um, that climate was part of the class as well, and I think that's very Austrian, as it's who you know, and things stay in, in a club, and often the boys' club. And I ended up switching to another class that just happened to have the most diverse, um, students body uh, in the in the academy I didn't realize it beforehand but once I got there it was just a completely different feeling um, another thing about studying art in Austria and I think it's better at the Angewandte but at the Bildenden at that point 
there were really no classes in English. I had one class in English. And of course, you can make the argument, well, you're in Austria, you should speak German, but we're also in an art world, which is <laughs> based on English. And so I thought that was also very, um, very old school. So that was my, my experience at the Bildenden. I have a question to you, Smiranda, about the feedback that you get from the different sides of your project, from the, let's say, the musicians, because uh, I saw the list of musicians you're bringing in and the artists. Um, how do both sides of your project feel about it afterwards? Um, thank you for this question. We actually uh, always send out feedback sheets, <laughs> so we actually have some data on this. <coughs> um, and uh, the artists really appreciate the fact that they get to meet new people. Quite obvious. Um, they meet people that they wouldn't normally meet. Uh, we have people in our program, getting back to the point of institutions, that did not study at Austrian art institutions. So this is very important, I think. Uh, to stress because as you were all saying now in most art production places in Austria you have to have some degree from some Austrian university um, and then if you have some degree from some Austrian university you mostly know the other people that were there so you're kind of in that bubble um, but in our project they meet people that are from other groups that are maybe not even really in the art scene at all they just do art um, after their day jobs in the evenings because coming to Austria, they couldn't do art full time anymore as they did uh, where they came from, right? Um, so it's very beautiful to see, and especially because it's focused so much on um, an individual friendship kind of. So one artist working together with one other artist over several months. So there are really friendships being created. And that's really beautiful to see. I and mean, it sounds very kitschy, but it was just really nice. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the feedback that we're getting. And artists really. Uh, have the opportunity to dwell into the art scene. So we see a lot of the artists that we're working with continuing to work with that person and working with people out of their, from their friend group, um, from the like Austrian uh, people, they get invited to more stuff. So it's really a sustainable change kind of, that they really stay in these groups and not just for this short project. Thank you, do we have any other questions? No? Okay, so then I'll go on. <laughs> Um, what advice would you give to you know young um, people working like th that is a question for both of you working in the cultural and artist scene feeling you know unheard or unseen like what advice would you give where th should they start okay think a little bit um, I mean <laughs> uh, make space for yourself I think you it dep yeah, young and old also. Um, anyone who's just young in terms of um, entering into the scene um, where you can try to make a space for yourself. I, I found it really important to um, to build collectives. So when I first started doing things, they were collectives that I founded. So that Sounds of Blackness, um, Series Black. They were um, a way for me to have, always to not just be in my head about how I want to do things, to think about how to work with others. But um, this kind of also gave me like a grounding, as you said, in a sustainable way, that these are friends, friendships that remained and um, collectives that have still remained to this day. So um, find, they don't have to be like-minded people, but find people that you are comfortable with. Don't underestimate the importance of having friends, being comfortable in the space and, um, feeling welcome, I think this can also, as an artist, as a creative, be super integral to your work and how you feel comfortable to produce and to create. So I think that, um, yeah, find a space, it doesn't have to be physical, when I'm also talking about a space within a collective or within people, um, with people that you feel comfortable with. Um, what else would I say? I think that's the, the main thing that I found was, was helpful to me and it's still sustain, um, supported me till now to actually create. Thank you. Would you like to add something? No, maybe not. I'm not no? sure yet. No. Probably not. Sure. Yeah, you can, you can add it <coughs> later. Um, let's say if, if we would dream now, you know, like, um, when would you say you have the feeling mission accomplished? In Austria. As in personally or like for Austria? Because <laughs> I'm like, mm. <laughs> You know, when would you say like, yes, we are there now, you know, like we opened all the spaces and we, you know. So maybe from our perspective a little, um, at the beginning when we started the project, we were 
thinking that we would also go into institutions a lot and really open up spaces. Uh, then we realized that this is a lot of work and we don't have the budget and the time for that. So we kind of focused on these very specific projects that we do. Like it's very clear, there's an open call, you work together, you exhibit, it's very clear. Um, but we don't do this kind of policy work. So our goal, we, our goal will never be accomplished because there will always be new people in Vienna. Um, so we do this consulting, supporting, getting people in touch with other people, and don't really work so much on the institutional side. So it's not like we have some goal to make um, some institutions more open, because people will always be new here, and they'll always need access, and you'll always need a place to go if you're a new artist in Vienna. Thank you. Would you like to? Um, I think um, in terms of what I want to do with my work, I think that it's an ongoing, ongoing process in terms of, as you said, there's always new mm -hmm. creatives, artists, and to kind of keep um, providing a platform for them. I think that since I've moved to Austria, so seven years, been here seven years now, I've already seen changes. Like I've seen, you know, discussions, you know, discussions panels, but also there's at least a kind of spark of, okay, this is something we need to think about is important. And I think that in 2014 when I moved here, I don't, that wasn't the case. So that isn't to say that they're not, especially within the community I'm talking about, specifically the black Austrian community, that, that there hasn't been people that we're standing on the shoulders of. There's Simone Inul, Vanessa Spambauer, Claudia Unterweger, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not even naming all of the amazing people that I'm, that I'm referencing. but. They've done the work, they've been doing the work, Pamoja, you know, there are a lot of communities and institutions and um, organizations, I should say, actually, that have kind of paved the way for it to be, Austria to be more open-minded and they're still doing that work constantly. I think for me personally, like within the events that I do or the projects that I do, there are little moments where I think, okay, I'm really happy that that happened or I'm really happy that there's an artist that comes up to me and says that they, they didn't think about doing their work in this way and they're really happy they had this platform or, <clears throat> we're at Stand 129 and we're having a drink with like the, the market store, stand next door. And for me, this is like the very humane moments that are like, that make you forget about policy or, you know, diversity policy or whatever diversity is. It's like, they're just very humane moments. And those are for me a little like, okay, there's like hope. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's, as I said, it's ongoing, an ongoing work. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Yes. <laughs> Don't be shy. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, another question is Miranda, because this is a new project for me. I didn't know about it before. Um, have you thought about, or are you already doing any kind of alumni work? So people that have gone through the program and are therefore mentoring others, because of course that could be a very useful tool. Um, yes, we try to include artists that were part of the past collectives uh, in the current work. So, um, for example, in the jury for this year's artist collective, because we have an open call, right, um, and people apply, and we always have a, a jury of three or four people. And in this year's jury, there was, for example, an artist from last year. And also in last year's jury, there was an artist from the year before. So people that also went through the program that can actually judge, is this person a good fit for this program? Would they actually benefit from it? Um, like. What is it like? Can they fit into this? Um, so this for one, um, and also uh, the curator, one of the curators this year is also an artist that participated last year. So this is kind of, we try to involve them um, also in what we do, and also um, for some events that we do extra. So this year we're planning this festival. Um, I was talking about also in July with the kids camp, also part of it and we're involving arts that we also worked with in the last years for them to also get to know the current collective. So for this festival, there'll be people from old collectives and the current collective working together. Uh, and we're also planning like fun parties just to get together again with the old collectives and the new ones. So definitely, it's very important because it's also kind of community building uh, practice and, uh, and people have something to share, right? So if you organize a party for the old collective and the new one, they actually have stuff to talk about and it's, it's not awkward because they can just, eh, how was the experience for you? It's quite easy to get in touch and start talking. That's like a concrete empowerment example of like when you allow artists, creatives to actually be in a decision-making position too and having that, they have the skill also to do that. So it's actually like full circle. And it's very nice because they, you know, like, um, it gets bigger and bigger, you know? And then uh, maybe the old artists can also open new doors for the new ones getting in. Um, huh. Cool.
question. Wow, was für eine Performance. I feel like I could have just speak out very loud. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, Tunic, I have a question for you. Given the fact that last year was also hitting the cultural sector a lot with like the pandemic, was there like a project that you would have said you enjoyed a lot and then maybe also ticked more boxes as in it was financially okay, you could involve people that you wanted and you also had ultimately power, which is important to make decisions. So is there one from the past? And is there something in the future where you're like, hey, am I actually really looking forward for this project? And if so, could you please tell us? <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, there were, um, there was a project beginning of, what year are we? <laughs> oh my God, I'm really confused by this. I so beginning of this year, February, right? Yes, February, Cyber Festival. Um, uh, contemporary immersive virtual art. It's a new concept by two brilliant um, uh, artistic directors and also curators, Eva Fisher from Soundframe and um, Angie Shahira Paul, and also Martina Meganon, actually, I forgot her. Um, and the three of them, uh, I've worked with them in different capacities, as I said, as a DJ, and they also recognize that I've been in the last years actually doing more curatorial work, and they asked me to curate for Cyber Festival as a discourse curator. So um, I was actually centering um, artists who were having a very clearly doing conceptual art and doing a more uh, social political, social justice in their art. So I did a curation program of this and also hosted the, um, the Cyber podcast. So I was also having conversations with the artists, but also the other curators. So this was something that I really enjoyed in terms of content and the way that I could curate, but also the way that they work. They're very much inclusive in terms of um, fair pay, um, also giving enough um, space to diverse curators, but also content. It was a digital program, so it worked during the pandemic. It was kind of, it kind of ticked a lot of boxes and they also had um, like an awareness team and code of conduct team who were doing monitoring of online conduct and um, to, actually, to actually enter the spaces and to, to view the galleries and the, the 3D spaces or virtual spaces, um, you had to click they set up a code of conduct which is written by a, by a lawyer and you have to accept, they have to accept that before you can actually access any of the art. So they had a support team that was on site and really answering any questions or there wasn't any incident actually. But I think that that is truly inclusive in terms of making sure that conduct and consumption of art is also a conscious, a very conscious space and also a safe space for the artist but also the audience. So that was one I think like prime example of, of, of an initiative that's that I was happy to work with because of the like the very thorough um, thinking of, of how to be truly inclusive. Um, and what's coming up next? Um, um, something that I'm looking forward to. My mind has gone blank now also. What am I working on right now? Kai Libra, Kai Libra, um, this urban uh, street art festival um, are having a collaboration with Vent Museum this year. <clears throat> excuse me, in August, it was July, now it's August, um, and they are an urban street, uh, urban street festival, street art festival, they're doing gra graffiti, murals, etc. And um, this year they want to focus on uh, specifically, as explicitly racism in the arts, and they are specifically curating in a way that they are <clears throat> including artists that deal with a bit more social injustice in their work, and um, they asked me to initially curate, uh, do a bit of the ramen program, but then the artists that I suggested, they asked, they actually wanted him for the main exhibition, so I kind of made my way in there. Um, and um, I'm really happy to work with that because it's actually dealing with, um, as I said, social injustice, but I'm working on a specifically a black Austrian history timeline with Vanessa Spanbauer and um, a black history illustrator specialist called Russell Chasley, who's from the Netherlands, but he specializes in illustrating black history. So. Um, that's a project that I think would be would get the it gets the institutional uh, recognition, but within that we have a lot of space to do what we and also it's called allow us to, to reintroduce ourselves. So it's about the perspective of history from those who have experienced it directly. Um, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, you could go for it. Thank you very much. Um, question for question and answer. Um, also about your like I know Smaranda you're not the you're not the curator of the event, but also like I would for me it would be interesting to know like how do you curate um, such a like a group of artists or like um, 
not in terms of uh, the artists themselves, but of their work. It's, it's I think it's pretty diverse and pretty uh, difficult to put one context. So, like, how do you um, somehow facilitate the curational process? I mean, the improper walls people are involved, um, I guess. With yeah, I think I think the main curator should speak about this. Yeah, if you want to. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for a question. Um, yeah, um, um, I will think how to answer now. Um, I was not ready now. Um, so, um, when we select artists, we also think about the first like the medium they work with and what art uh, and what art they do. And uh, also, what are the concepts, what are the uh, topics, themes, what they're interested in. And this is also one of the aspects like, of how we peer at look at it also. And then when they when we think about, um, um, we really think about something like that. It should be a bit, um, uh, not the same mediums that both artists are working on. Like, so for us, it's very interesting, like have a challenge. Sorry, and uh, <clears throat> and then uh, and then of course, like as now, uh, ours as creators' work is like to help them to find this like common ground together, but in terms also <clears throat> on um, what they want to express with, with their artwork, like what they what they're interested in, what really brings them together, and then like to put together two different mediums, and maybe even different. Um, we are focused on, but uh, you know, we uh, like, I don't know, I can tell the example, like, you know, I met like two artists um, last week, I worked with like two wonderful artists and it was one of the first our meetings together, so first meetings I would always attend, then I would already say, okay, now you can also do things without me, if you want to invite me, if you need me, or if you need some advice, I'm gonna be there um, but we basically just um, had a, um, a small talk at the beginning, like how was your day, what you did, and trying to get to know each other on this very, very personal level. And then we decided like, to think like, more on a conceptual like, um, level, like what's, what's, what's interesting, what's important for us, like what you're working on, uh, what you're working on, like uh, what I'm interested in, and, tried it, um, and started to try to find this like, matching points and try to find this common ground and um, and most uh, most of the times actually like in terms of how we work like as a curator as an artist the curators uh, our team of curators they choose artists they want to work like according to the topics we are interested in so i work like a lot of work uh, on social political topics because it's very interesting for me our identity other curators are work uh, with like bio art or um or like uh, really like uh, fine arts, so it's it's different, and and I think the outcome is also different. That's why that's why we select like diverse artist groups and diverse topics and concepts and approaches, and yeah, and then everything comes together at the end in one big group show with different stories, which were narrated by this artist working together for a certain time. Thank you so much, Justina. Um, I would also like to know, um, is there actually a topic, like, you know, a topic for all the artists and then you do the exhibition or is it like completely free? It's Com very free and that's a very crucial point. Um, I think that's what you wanted to hear from me now also, uh, kind of the direction. Uh, half of them are migrant artists and they don't have to do anything related to their origin, or like anything that people project on them. Some people do, of course, like, feel free to do whatever you want, but there is no obligation whatsoever. Um, so as Justina was saying, bio art, lots of bio art actually, last year and this year now again, um, all kinds of stuff. And that's super important because also artists say, oh, this is one of the few exhibitions that I'm doing since I'm in Vienna where I'm not put in the box of uh, you're the migrant artist, uh, teach us about racism or something. Yeah. Um, I can do something that I'm really interested in and not 
Yeah, thing. not having to always be in the educating role or uh, taking a certain perspective um, of showing the audience uh, your reality, like w what has my life been like, sharing very personal stuff. And when will this exhibition be, actually? Uh, the current artist collective mm -hmm. that we're working with... Because uh, they just be, started, right? Yeah, so. they will be exhibiting at the end of November in Agi Achtsen in the 1st District. Okay. Agi Achtsen, it's Urban Art Gallery in the 1st District, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, are there like any other questions from the audience? Or maybe online, do you all online audience, do you have any comments for us? No? Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I hope so. Um, Maybe for the exhibitions, I can also add. Mm -hmm. Somebody's interested before November already. For the artists that are part of our collective, we also um, organize small exhibits for them throughout the year, so like satellite exhibitions. Ah. So they get to work with other curators together. So we're planning an exhibit at Rudolf Leib Gallery in the first district also. So we also go into feel like fancy places, which is very important mm -hmm. to us, mm -hmm. to not stay um, always in, uh, uh, in the free scene kind of, but really the, the space that also belongs to them and should mm -hmm. belong to them. Um, so there we have corporations running with red carpet showrooms, so there's showrooms in the metro stations, these big yeah. ones. So once a year um, our curators create, uh, curate the, the one at Karlsplatz, the big one, um, and, and some other stuff, I think two, three more this year with Kunstkram Zupa, like stuff like that. So always then smaller groups of the collective and exhibit there together, and then at the end all of them together kind of. And for example, at the gallery, uh, does the people who own the gallery also have a um, word and like, you know? Yeah, we, we try to n not do it at all, like, um, like us renting the space, but it's about the artists engaging with the gallery owners. So we kind of like, you know, this is an opportunity to, for you to meet new artists. Mm -hmm. We're just bringing them to you kind of. Um, and that's cool for us because that way they have to engage with them and we're not just renting it. Okay, I guess, uh, ich weiß nicht wie viel, like, I did not look at the time at all. We started a little late, so we have still 15 minutes if you want, but if you want to have the full one hour break, um, I think food is ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any que now it's like really the last chance you have to ask any questions. <laughs> Yes, that's true. Like after after lunch, I mean, like we can talk at lunch a lot and exchange and network, but then afterwards, we actually have program as well. So please stay. It's gonna be super interesting. I really want to say thank you, Smiranda, and thank you, Tonika, for thank being you. here today, and thank you for everyone who is watching us online and the live audience as well. It was very nice. Enjoy the sunny day. And let's go get some food, that's it. <laughs>